when it's in half a day, the committee is back from recess. Um, as the author of resolution number 55-36 COR, I'm calling this virtual public hearing to order. It is now 3.04 PM, Thursday, April 15th, 2021. Notice of this afternoon's virtual hearing was provided via email to senators, stakeholders, and the local media on April 8th, 2021 for the five-day notice and April 13th, 2021 for the 48-hour notice, thus meeting the requirements of op open government law. I'd like to acknowledge my colleagues that are here today, uh, Senator Tello Taitigui, uh, thank you for being here, and Senator Joanne Brown, Sijos Masi. Uh, the purpose of this virtual public hearing is to receive testimony on resolution number 55-36 COR, sponsored by myself, Senator Sabina flores Perez, co-sponsored by Speaker Teresa M. Terlaki, uh, Senator Talina Cruz Nelson, Senator Clinton E. Rigel, Senator Jose Pito Terlaki, Vice Speaker Tina Rose Munoz Barnes and Senator Tello T. Taitigui. It's relative to reaffirming our human right to safe and clean drinking water in ob observance of World Water Day 2021 and recognizing the importance of protecting our Northern Guam lands aquifer and precious water resources and ensuring the health of our people. My office will receive testimony until 4 p.m. Tuesday, April 20th, 2021. Uh, please address testimony to myself, Senator Sabina flores Perez. It can be dropped off at the mailboxes of the Guam Congress Building or email to office at senatorperez.org. To go over the rules of conduct for this virtual hearing, the host will mute all participants until called upon by the host. Virtual backgrounds should not be utilized during this time. Uh, participants' face must be visible at all times. Uh, when called to speak, please ensure that you are unmuted and that you are speaking into your microphone. Members of the committee wishing to speak may indicate their desire to the chair through the in-app chat feature. The order of questioning will begin with the chairperson and followed by senators. Individuals testifying shall be first recognized by the chair before speaking and shall state their name for record keeping purposes. Questions and testimony shall be confined to the substance or nature of the agenda. Personal inference as to character or motive of any senator or any individual testifying is not permitted. Any violations of this general rule of conduct will result in removal from the public hearing by the host. And now to begin the agenda on resolution number 55-36 COR, sponsored by myself, Sabina, Senator Sabina Flores Perez, uh, co-sponsored by Speaker Teresa Terlaki, Senators Tulina Cruz Nelson, Clint Rigel, Jose Tito Terlaki, Vice Speaker Tina Rose Minnie Barnes, and Senator Teletai relative to reaffirming our human right to safe drinking and clean water in observance of World Water Day 2021 and recognizing the importance of protecting our Northern Guam lands aquifer and precious water resources in ensuring the health of our people. If I can just provide a brief opening statements. So half a day, everyone. Uh, the purpose of this hearing is to receive testimony on resolution 55-36. The right to safe drinking and drinking water and sanitation is affirmed by the United Nations General Assembly Resolution A64292. Each year, the United Nations reaffirms its commitment to this right on World Water Day. The theme of this year's commemoration is valuing water. For many indigenous peoples, water isn't just valued as a resource. Rather, it holds a spiritual significance and plays an important role in many cultures. As indigenous Pacific Islanders, water is especially significant to Chamorro people and for thousands of years, our ancestors have acted as stewards of our environment, which today is threatened by overdevelopment, contamination, and militarization. Our Northern Guam lands aquifer is a sole source aquifer and it's the primary source of water for 80% to 90% of our residents in our island community. The aquifer is delicately maintained by the protection of our limestone and ravine forests and other habitats. This ecosystem is particularly threatened by the development of the main cantonment in the live fire training range complex, which consists of five separate ranges above the aquifer. Meanwhile, US EPA has determined that these projects result in substantial deforestation, significant impacts to terrestrial biological resources, which have already experienced a serious decline. Firing ranges across the United States are known to be contaminated many years afterward despite remediation efforts. In particularly, Resolution 55 is concerned with the potential contamination from lead and other heavy metals due to 6.7 million rounds of ammunition that would be fired annually 
for an indefinite period of time. Lacking in these federal actions is the acknowledgement and implementation of the right of small people to free prior informed consent. There is a long record of community resistance to military development on island by grassroots organizations, as well as many of my colleagues in the legislature. This resolution calls for solidarity against contamination of our people's water resource and urges local, national, international bodies to prevent the contamination. I thank all of you for your participation today and I look forward to hearing your testimony. So I would like to recognize um, uh, let's see, Maria Hernandez uh, to provide her testimony. Honorable, honorable senators, uh, all of our leaders that are here today and all of our, the members of our community who have come out to discuss this very important legislation. And thank you so much, Senator Sabina, for holding this extremely important public hearing to bring the public's attention to the vital cultural and environmental importance of our sole source aquifer. I am in full support of resolution 55-36. I believe this is common sense legislation that should be at the forefront of the conversation, especially at this critical point in time as our clean water source is under threat of contamination. And we really should all take note of every Senator who signs on and supports this legislation. Um, it's not just about our, um, I mean, uh, access to clean drinking water is not only an environmental and cultural issue, it's a public health issue, it's a human rights issue. And any Senator who doesn't support legislation that seeks to protect our community's access to clean drinking water, we really should implore them as to why they are serving in public office. I mean, is it not to protect uh, the community? And um, clean water is sacred, clean water is so important and I, I read articles all the time about communities that are struggling um, because they don't have access to clean drinking water and we don't want to look back and say what if, what could we have done? We want to be proactive and protect our main water source. Um, we really are in a very um, blessed situation on this island to have such a resource um, where we don't have to rely on imported water. Uh, I know of, of uh, a few islands in the region that have to rely on imported bottled water, bottled water and we don't want that for our island. Uh, as a mother, this hits me even harder because everything that I do, all of my work in the community over the years, I really do it for my children and for their children and all of our uh, nannies. And um, so, one second. I wanted to bring attention to a study, 2016 study that I found um, It, it's a study in Scientific Reports Journal that found that moderate tree cover can increase groundwater recharge and that tree planting and various tree management options can improve groundwater resources. And as I was reading through this study, my thoughts really went to the massive amounts of clearings that have been done um, in, uh, during buildup construction. This is really, really troubling. I'm sure that everybody has seen the, um, the photos that have been circulating of the massive clearings. And um, this is uh, 900 football fields of native land that are being cleared for build up construction. And it really makes you question how the aquifer will be able to adequately recharge when our trees are being um, when our trees are being cut down and we're losing our our land in northern Guam. 
So um, let me see. So I also wanted to, it's something that I feel community groups have brought up many, many times over the years, um, just concerns about uh, access to safe drinking water ever since the buildup was first it's been something that's been, um, that's been brought up in numerous public hearings. Um, and the U.S. Marine Life Fire Training Range above our main water source uh, is expected to 6.7 million rounds of ammunition are expected to be shot above our aquifer and um, and it's it's lead and heavy heavy metals are known to accumulate in soils at training ranges so it really does make you very concerned about um, how this would adversely affect the health of our aquifer and also want to note that the military's SEIS has indicated that the overextraction of water from the aquifer can result in saltwater intrusion, and that could really harm our aquifer. But despite these, this study being very clear, plans for the buildup continue, uh, despite the um, findings that there will be an increased annual, or despite the um, plans for an increased annual withdrawal of groundwater of 1.7 million gallons each day. And the SEIS also indicated an increase in the rate of sewage spills impacting groundwater quality from ex potential exposure to additional raw sewage and higher levels of chloride concentrations in the aquifer. And I mean, the, the, the SEIS is very clear. We, we as a community should really be um, Bringing these, bringing these points to the forefront uh, and continuing to bring these points to the forefront because we have a number of special interest groups in the community who really are putting their pockets before the, the health of our community. And um, you know, there are a lot of companies that are benefiting financially from uh, these build-up projects and uh, you know, including groups like the Guam Chamber of Commerce that have from the very beginning, despite 900 football fields of native land being cleared and despite um, cultural and environmental impacts and um, you know, the potential contamination of our drinking water are still going full force in, in um, um, lobbying uh, in favor of, of uh, lobbying to support these projects that have so, so many adverse impacts to our community. So we need to, as a community, continue to push back. And that is why I'm so grateful to leaders um, who have signed on to this legislation. Um, I really think it's important for everybody here to speak with their networks and to, um, to let them know who doesn't sign uh, this resolution because it, it really is very telling um, when you have leaders in the community that don't care about our community having access to clean drinking water. And lastly, reliable access to clean water is essential for achieving the UN Sustainable Development Goals, which is something that our administration has um, our administration is working with UOG currently to, um, to find ways to support sustainable development goals. So we really should be seeing our administration also taking a hard stance in protection of our clean drinking water. So Sijus uh, Maasi, for the sake of time, I'm not gonna really go into much more, but really appreciate this opportunity to speak out in protection of our water. Sisu Masi. Sisu Masi, uh, Maria, for your, your presentation and testimony. So we will actually have the pictures shortly, um, the pictures that you're you um, referring to. Um, but at this time, I would like to recognize Speaker Chilak, who has joined us uh, today. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, so while we're, while we're getting those pictures up, uh, I would like to recognize the next person on the list to testify 
uh, from Potahila Texan, uh, Jessica Nagauta. Thank you, Jessica. I'll make this uh, really short and brief. Um, I am here representing my family and generations before me to testify in support of Resolution 55-36. I'm so grateful for you senators introducing this resolution and it shows me that and our community that you're not only thinking about today but generations and generations beyond us that you are acknowledging the actions taken today have an effect on our future, on the future of our island home. As a mother, first and foremost, I care deeply for the safety of my children and the future they will inherit. As women, we carry our future in our wombs for nine months being completely surrounded by sacred hanum. We all come from our mother's hanum. How special it is and how, how much needed that is. It's crucial in so many ways to sustain our lives and in more ways that we may even realize, both physically and spiritually. As a lanchera, I am mindful about my hands' effect on the land and the hanam and take great honor and care in growing food and medicine to help nourish and grow our, our community in a sustainable and just manner. So again, I thank everyone that comes out here today to speak in support of this um, resolution, Mega Maasi senators for being so brave to allow us this resolution to be heard and giving our community a chance to be more informed and allow our voices to be heard. We cannot let being bound by our political status keep us from liberating our minds. The power is always with the people. And the more we acknowledge the injustices, the more we will rise as individuals and community to be the change we want to see. Sainamasi. Sainamasi, Jessica. Thank you so much. Thank you for that testimony. Just uh, Masi. Uh, I'd like to recognize now Moneka Flores from Pertahila, Texan. Jesus Masi, Senator Perez. And um, thank you all for allowing us the time to provide testimony this afternoon, half a day. My name is Nake Flores, and I'm actually representing Perte of the Texan Sabertidian, as well as the Hagen Famalawan Guahan, an indigenous Chamorro women's organization, um, centering Chamorro values um, in our work, but also the importance of decolonization and demilitarization um, in, in terms of the, the main factors impacting the health well-being and future of our people in our island. We sincerely want to thank Senator Sabina Flores Perez and her co-sponsors, Speaker Teresa Terlahi, Senator Selena Cruz Nelson, Senator Clint Rigel, Senator Jose Terlahi, uh, Senate Vice Speaker Tina um, Muni Barnes, and of course Senator Teletaidwi for this resolution for Resolution 55-36. Resolution 55-36 is, 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 is critical as a substantive resolution because it puts on record the many generations of environmental racism that our island has had to endure and the real risks imposed on numerous generations that come long after we are all gone from this earth. Um, when we, we prepare our comments for the programmatic agreement memos, we have a hard time uh, you know, just focusing on what those memos refer to as historic properties because these are not just properties. These are not just tangible objects. These, this is evidence of the sacred life of our ancestors. And so we also ask ourselves, is, should we consider the aquifer and other bodies of water also historic properties? Mm -hmm. and, and the answer for us in Patela, Texan is yes, because this is a life-giving force. This is our living ancestor. When we look at our creation story, the cre our creators, brother and sister, Potna and Ponten, we are not separate from the land and the water. We, these are our relatives. We exist literally as part of our natural world because of our ancestors. And so there is no disconnection. And the aquifer is very much our life-giving force, our living ancestor that needs our protection. Um, we don't have to look very far to look at the destruction of aquifers because of human activity. We can look as you know, close as the Northern Marianas Islands and look at the inadequacy of um, fresh drinking water, 
uh, the delivery of fresh drinking water to our brothers and sisters in Saipan. We can look in, at Hawaii to look at the, at the devastating impacts military bombing has done to places like Koholawe, where just with just a few decades of destruction, it's going to take several generations and, 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 and millions and millions of dollars to try to clean up something that might never be repaired. This is, is an important and critical resolution because it, it, it lets the world know that we, the entire community, the people of Guam, we're going on record to acknowledge the, the, the threats to our safety, the threats to our health, the threats to our survival and our security, our genuine security and, and, the, and the long history of contamination and violence, environmental violence and environmental racism. As Maria mentioned, we are starting to, we're going to anticipate the withdrawal of 1.7 million gal gallons of water a day from our aquifer with this relocation of Marines from Okinawa to Guam. On top of that, 6.7 million ammunitions a year fired over our aquifer, heavy metals, propellants. We, are, we will be so susceptible to, 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 to this horrible, devastating uh, contamination. And on top of that, the massive clearing of, of limestone forests affecting the recharge of our aquifer. All of these harmful activities, they really, um, they make us so vulnerable. When we look when, with, the, with, with COVID, we saw that the military cannot protect us. The military is not the real answer for security. The military is not going to help lead our people into the future and, and protect tomorrow people for, and, and future generations of the people of Guam. And, and we can say that, you know, we need, with this threat to our aquifer, we need to also pause and ask, what are we really protecting when, with the increased military activities and the increased military destruction, we're not protecting much for our future generations. And so I just wanna thank you for the opportunity to provide testimony today. And we encourage all um, the entire body um, in the legislature to please support this resolution and, and Suzo Smaki. Thank you so much, uh, Maneka, for your words and testimony. Um, truly grateful. Um, thank you. So uh, now I'd like to recognize uh, Rick Paris, a community member, for his testimony. Buenas, Senator Paris, and all the uh, senators present and who supported or who are supporting Resolution 55-36. Um, I'm testifying in support of the resolution, and I wanted to say that the uh, it takes courage to do what you're doing, and I'm very grateful for the leadership that you and your colleagues are taking on this uh, issue of human rights violations and uh, representations of uh, some more dispos dispossession of our civilization when it comes to water. Uh, all of this started with a rape of a 12-year-old middle school girl who was walking home uh, by two Marines and a sailor who were stationed at Camp Hansen. They raped her, they dumped her in the field, and they left her to be. This was in 1995. That was a spillover, caused the bilateral tensions between the United States and Japan, bringing about the decision to relocate Marines to Guam from uh, certain headquarters elements in Okinawa. Uh, so the question that has, or, or one of the questions I have is, what is a range? And one definition is that it has firing lanes, firing lines, positions, maneuver areas, test pads, detonation pads, impact areas, buffer zones, and airspace designated areas. Uh, in other words, it's comprised of a lot of different components. Uh, my general environmental statements are the Pentagon is already one of the world's worst pollutions, uh, worst polluters. 900 military sites are labeled Superfund sites. Guam has never been fully cleaned up for return to full human use. The ongoing risk profile on Guam for military activity is getting worse, and the highly vulnerable aquifer system uh, is based on, or it has a very uh, sensitive uh, soil permeability and porosity. Uh, the net negative footprint that the military likes to use in its PR campaigns, in my opinion, doesn't make sense because this issue of uh, you know World Water Day and, and this resolution relate to subsurface areas not surface areas um, and uh, if this is small arms related uh, 
one question that pops up is should it also include possible mortar and artillery and hand grenade issues? I believe the hand grenade range is going to be also uh, put in place. I'm not too sure about mortar and artillery though for the island. Uh, the water lens has already been compromised many decades ago by unexploded ordnance, lead, fuel spills, solvents, PFAS, PFOS, and TCE contamination. Currently, Guam has uh, seven readily known high risk sites associated with detonations. Uh, in military parlance, uh, alphanumerically, it's called areas 101, area 106, area 108, Lonfit, Miyama Hills, Guam Site 1 near Bubula Hills. Guam Nick Tam's Westpac and up in Saipan, you're talking Northfield, Marpy Point, and uh, Neftan, two sites in the southeastern portion of Saipan. Uh, unfortunately, the, the United States Marine Corps has had uh, plenty of examples to draw from, draw from on environmental catastrophe with groundwater. Camp Lejeune, close to 1 million people over decades have been, uh, can, you know, uh, have become sick because of fuel dumping, dry clean, dry clean chemicals, solvents discharged on base at Camp Lejeune that has resulted in several hundred people uh, getting sick and dying of blood cancer, bladder cancer, breast cancer, and having miscarriages. In Okinawa, the Marines have a very uh, sketchy uh, history of, on the approximate 11 bases of, number one, not informing the government of Japan on when they have environmental uh, spills or accidents. Number two, violating their own uh, guidelines in which they follow. From 2002 to 2016, Senator, there were 270 environmental accidents in Oki, with only six reported to the government of Japan to include toxic runoff at Camp Hansen. And 600 fires occurred at Camp, Camp Hansen and Schwab from live fire training, ma'am. Uh, there are many dangers to Guam from ranges, uh, and they include the following. Casing disposal, casing, which is what holds the round. Inhalation of lead dust and residual lead, aerosolized toxins. How much lead tonnage is going to be produced from this, uh, these live firing ranges, let alone from the small firing ranges, uh, how much lead tonnage will be produced? How will the spent ammo be claimed? In other words, how will it be picked up and managed? Is there a management plan to protect uh, the water lens? Water lens? What is the soil, air, and water testing plans and how often will they be performed? How will toxic soil be managed and how often? How many areas within the range are to be tested and what are the site concentrations for the most toxic substances? What role does OSHA play? What government of Guam laws, if any, are in place to regulate range design and range maintenance? What comprehensive systems will be in place to address all erosion risks and drainage. How will Guam prevent and mitigate vulnerability in terms of preferential water flow pathways where contaminants can easily flow, risks tied to geochemical conditions of the current state of the total water lens, and also, ma'am, the age of the water. Who will remove spent ammo from the beach, the reef areas, and outside the reef? What are the variations in use levels of uh, firing? Because even though the, the formal document states 6.7 million or, or thereabouts, uh, depending on the, on the operational status, the, the total average and just the total amount of lead introduced into uh, the island can see sharp spikes depending on a host of considerations. Uh, DOD identified 20 sites on Guam, ma'am, according to the GAO and, uh, and, and, and the Northern Marianas, uh, suspected of being contaminated from military munitions, which contain 200 chemical contaminants, and there are 20 munitions constituents of greatest concern, according to the GAO. Uh, within the American empire, 100 million people uh, receive their drinking water from underground sources which represents approximately 33% of the total American population. Guam, however, as we all know, has uh, uh, a percentage of approximately 70 or 80%, from what I understand, uh, as a sole source for drinking water, which makes it even more important that this resolution 5536 is, is approved and um, 
you know, supported. Uh, the EPA talked about in, in groundwater with dangerous dissolved, what they call RDX and HMX, which are contaminants that can uh, that contaminate shallow groundwater tables, which I believe uh, the water lens is it's a, sh it's a shallow groundwater table because of the permeability of the soils. There are dangers of propellant residues, explosive residues, um, residues from hand grenades, metal residues at berms. Berms are where the area where the, the round hits. And for small arms alone, ma'am, uh, we're talking about medical, metal metallic constituents such as copper, lead, zinc, and tungsten. Uh, three considerations that I'd like to just share and to wrap it up are that the possibility of updating or establishing new laws because of, th of the toxicity going beyond the actual range surface land site, which is separate and distinct from the subsurface uh, site uh, in which the aquifer is located. Um, also, uh, the possibility of new laws or laws being updated for range design and maintenance that um, would you know help fill any gaps typhoon and storm drainage laws other territorial territorial hazardous waste management programs or superfund laws all in union perhaps or uh, is add-ons to safe drinking water act the resource conservation recovery act clean water act and clean air act um, but most importantly, I think that solid waste and hazardous waste produced at ranges may, may not be considered as so under federal law, thus opening up huge gaps in how ranges are managed according to Comnav Moore and GRM, which they like to talk about in their public relations as being in compliance, which is not the same as being complete. Uh, second point is, uh, as a useful reference, if it hasn't already been reviewed, is the Code of Federal Regulations, Title 40, Protection of Environment, Volume 25, Subpart sub M, Military Munitions, Chapter 1. And uh, my very last point is this. The military, especially on Guam and the NMI, has information that some morals and the villagers need to demystify a variety of concerns of highest importance to human health, cultural health, and total well being. It is also true, Senator, that the interagency led by the military on Guam is dictating the informational options made available to the general public and to villagers, thus, exercising a level and degree of control, influence, and coercion that is found nowhere else. Examples are the overuse of the terminology, it's a matter of national security, it's actionable, it's non-actionable. Thus, the Guam legislature and, and the Guam congressmen have it within their appropriate rules to consider seeking answers to questions posed. The public and the Guam media are not provided enough information, are not providing enough information and support, or excuse me, not enough support for Guam lawmakers to challenge or ask questions to the military on matters of human health and well-being. Thus, this allows for the military to act with relative impunity because it is immunized, in my opinion, from deep and ongoing public scrutiny. It is not the military's role, Senator, or the interagency's role to control or to do a check on the Guam legislature or the governor of Guam or the mayor's council of Guam. The military's role is, is in doc is one of indoctrination to follow orders from its chain of command, which emanates via agency from Washington, D.C. Uh, triangulated, triangulated communications between Congress, the White House, and the Secretary of Defense might be of uh, great assistance to the Guam legislature as it moves forward, as opposed to dealing directly and unilaterally, perhaps, with uh, the Joint Region Marianas. Thank you, Senator. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Perez. Um, yes, uh, these are definitely concerns that I would like to follow up with. Um, and if we can maybe reach out to you to strengthen these laws and uh, policies within our government. And um, I did invite uh, several of the regulatory agencies to be here today. Uh, and I'm, I'm so happy that um, uh, Julian Johnson's here representing 
um, Bureau of Statistics and Plans, the Coastal Zone Management Program, uh, who's in charge of federal consistency, which is just one of the agencies that are involved in the regulatory aspects. So uh, we definitely will continue with this discussion to ensure that you know, we are, our, our people are protected, um, considering the huge amount of uh, toxicity uh, at stake. So it's just my yeah, and as a former Marine, I'm, I'm, I'm absolutely um, horrified by what the Marine Corps is doing on Guam. It's disgusting. It doesn't uh, represent the best of American values. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Perez. Um, so at this time, I'd like to recognize uh, Kyle Tehillig uh, for his testimony on Resolution 5536. So you are available at this time. When is in half a day, inan husi tanum, kumeki like nyan to plant. I also go by Kyle Dehilig. I serve as the chairperson for the Committee on Environment, Utilities, and Transportation, Gimine Chun Tai Tres, Nai Kongoshon Manhoban Guahan, and other roles in the community. Wait, sorry. I support Resolution 5536, and although my love for, sorry. I keep getting. I support Resolution 5536, and although my love for plants and extends beyond the moon and the stars for um, myself, my first environmental initiative I ever completed was with the fundamental to life, Hanum. I didn't know it at the time that water is something sacred or important or even valuable, because I thought that something as free as rain and fast as faucets was something that couldn't ever be scarce. I just thought it's just water. Today, we live as if something as free flowing and renewable as Hanum can never run dry. Maybe it will, or maybe it won't. But we know that our aquifers are permeable and anything that soaks through the soils will eventually trickle through, drip, and poison our sacred life source. Today we have water, but I'm not sure about tomorrow. I'm glad that this resolution recognizes Hanum as sacred and calls for the stopping of the Department of Defense's destruction over our aquifers. And I hope that our continued fight for safeguarding our environment guides us towards solutions that protect our waters, lands, and soils, and encourage us to pass legislation that leads us towards 100% sustainability, like putting solar panels on top of our schools and homes. Uh, Kyle, for your, for your testimony. Um, at this time, I'd like to recognize um, former Senator Hope Cristobal uh, to provide testimony on, on Resolution 5536. Sidus is Senator. Um, Senator Sabina Flores Paris, Buenas and Hafadai. Sidus Masi, Donkuluna Sidus Masi. Speaker Therese Terlahi, Senator Talina Nelson, and members of the committee. For many, many years, I have stood in front after I've left office there and promoted the healing of our people, the safety of our people, having known so many things about this massive militarization. I want to thank you for introducing this, what I think this resolution is very earth shattering for me. Um, <clears throat> it, I would like for you to e expand its proper distribution and I'd like to talk about that much later, but I am just really taken aback by the kinds of destruction that we see here every day when we drive up to Litekjen. I chair the Northern Guam Soil and Water Conservation District Board, mandated under 5 GCA Chapter 21, as stewards of soil and water conservation, all elected board members are on a constant mode of advocating for soil and water conservation practices, good soil health, water protection throughout the island. The collaborative spirit between Southern Soil and Water Conservation District Board and 
our Northern Soil and Water Conservation District Board make it possible for many projects to occur, one of which we recently <clears throat> engaged, which is the contamination study of Guam. My testimony today will basically provide you the kind of overview information that propelled us to do, to do this contamination study. We felt that we needed a study that would better inform as to the state of our island soil and water in order to more adequately program conservation practices. It is common knowledge that the US military uses a variety of highly toxic substances and having operated their bases here for seven, over 75 years on Guam, with the Anderson Air Force Base being located over the Northern Guam Lens Aquifer, elevated our concern on the board about the safety for human consumption and the availability of water for agricultural communities from the municipal wells. Northern Guam soil is relatively thin with basically a veneer of soils that filter water seeping into the Northern Guam Lens Aquifer. High nitrate levels have also been reported in runoffs of surface water in central and southern Guam. In and around military bases, toxics buried in the soil, including airfields, naval ports, residential areas surrounding civilian communities do seep into the aquifer, groundwater, and surrounding coastal waters. In this, Guam shares a history of contamination with many US and overseas military based communities. But the contamination in Guam is much more severe than at any other US domestic basis for a variety of reasons. And these include the high concentration of military bases per square mile. 28% of our lands is under DOD control in Guam. Guam's non-sovereign -so status and its effect on attitudes towards our own people's health and well-being. Guam having been a battlefield in World War II and a central launching pad for the war in Vietnam in particular, including Guam's lack of visibility in the U.S. national press, which has helped expose contamination problems elsewhere. The following include the chemical footprint of the US military. Number one, the use of extremely high volumes of petroleum fuels, including jet fuel, diesel, gasoline, benzene, perchlorate, and their combustion byproducts. The US military used 86 million barrels of fuel in FY 2016 for operational purposes. Air Force bases are the heaviest consumers of these fuels. Number two, the extensive use of herbicides to create perimeters around bases and training areas and to defoliate areas from which enemy exclusion is sought, including Agent Orange. Extensive use of pesticide in military buildings, particularly in foreign and tropical environments, including in the past, DDT and chlordane, use of strong solvents to wash down jets, ships, and tanks. These include TCE or trichloroethylene and perchloroethylene perk, also known as volatile organic compounds or VOCs. Their health effects include damage to the nervous system and to the skin, especially. These chemicals are easily converted to gas from liquid form and when inhaled, damage the lungs. They cause cancer and birth defects. The Camp Lejeune case that uh, Mr. Rick Perry spoke about, the case of TCE contamination is instructive. Engine maintenance products. Heavy metals with high toxicity, including such things as arsenic and lead used in um, ammunition. Training ranges can cause millions of rounds, a, a, can use millions of rounds a year, only some of which is or was collected after it was spent. 
radioactive materials used in munitions from DU or depleted uranium to nuclear missiles. Many of these chemicals are used in domestic civilian contexts as well, of course, but what makes their toxicity and impact on human health often so much more severe in military applications are several things, including the idea that national security institutions, institution needs trump all other institutional or human needs, and that it allows for less democratic openness, more secrecy in its operations. The related intense investment in military institutions which allows for higher rates of consumption of the toxins than would otherwise be the case in more resource limited contexts. The inequality that exists in places like Guam where the military has chosen to place its facilities, they tend to be in poorer, these bases tend to be in poorer rather than wealthier areas whose residents have more clout in Washington, DC. The military operates its bases in Guam with the impunity that comes with Guam's colonial situation. Exposure of enlisted personnel to contaminants on bases and as workers with those substances, often more extremely exposed in those short periods of their deployment presumably creating incentives to control contaminations. Those personnel who have limited time on island, their exposure to the contaminants in comparison with lifetime residents. It is the highly, it is the highly predictable and consistent chemical footprint of the US military that impressed the need for our respective boards to do the study on behalf of our farmers and ranchers, the agricultural community, and our own island residents. Furthermore, the egregious effects of Guam's massive militarization with the live fire training ranges, degrading the destruction of huge swaths of limestone forests and habitats of indigenous flora and fauna are obvious conservation concerns. This includes the destruction of traditional Chamorro village and sacred burial grounds of our village residents there. All these and more provide an overview that summons us to our senses to ask more questions, search for more answers, leveraged leverage by our human rights to water, clean and safe water for all living things within our small island ecosystem. We have been working on the contamination study for over a couple of years now. Although we have to wrap up the study with an expected completion of July, 2021, we are not able to complete our map of historical contamination sites because of the failure of the military to share their data requested in our FOIAs. We find that the US military is not responding in a helpful way to our FOIA so that we may know what the water impacts have been more fully. Our respective conservation district boards, the Southern Board and the Northern Board will be able to share our findings in a more complete document this coming July. Due to the short time that for the notice for this meeting, this public get together, we can only provide you the salinization map which shows the overdraw on Guam's water resources over time, degrading water quality. I will have to provide that later on because I couldn't download it. Uh, the creation of a super fun site on Anderson Air Force Base that still has not been cleaned up after 25 years of, of its designation and failing to release their toxic measurements from the site. The approximately dozen unremediated formerly used defense sites, which can have which, which can have been may have been leaking toxins into the water supply from World War II on. Numerous jet jet fuel spills along the pipeline 
over decades from the Navy port over to the aquifer to Anderson and numerous spills at Anderson. Various sites returned to the people of Guam without remediation over the years, some of which cannot allow normal human use and have potential water polluting effects. I want to thank you for the courage that this legislature is showing early in its tenure of two years, it's short time. We need to continue to empower the people by your actions in the legislature. And I want to thank you again, from the bottom of my heart. We want to celebrate World Waterway in Guam, but it is a dream. We wait for the day when our celebration is not only justified, but truly and honestly meaningful and fulfilling. And I urge all senators of the 36th legislature to vote yes on this resolution. To do some Aussie Senator Sabina Perry's for your courage and for inspiring your fellow senators in the legislature. Thank you, Messages Mossy, Senator Hope Cristobal, um, for your leadership and um, your guidance throughout all these years um, and being vigilant, um, especially you know, for the legacy, the contamination legacy, in addition to the emerging contaminants such as PFAS. So yeah. to do as much. I'd like to recognize at this time, Katie McManus uh, for her testimony. To do as much, Katie. Welcome to Katie. Uh, I'm a local activist, mother of four, and I'm also the founder of Mantras for the Marianas. We're a spiritual collective, um, and I'm just going to read a little bit about what we're about. Um, our mission is to inspire Tao Tao Tanu to send their energy and vibrations towards the healing of our Marianas Islands through mantras, prayer, and chant in the sacred language of our ancestors. We know that indigenous people have done this for thousands of years. Our people have done this since the beginning of time. Um, and indigenous people have always known, uh, they've always had a very close relationship with water, the land. And um, indigenous people have always said that water is sacred and water carries memory. And this is actually, this is a fact that was actually proven by Dr. Masaru Imoto in recent times. For decades, he did experiments with water. He spoke love and healing to some samples of water. And then he spoke negativity and hate to um, other samples of water. He froze the water and with his technology, he was able to examine that the molecular structure of the water changed. Um, the water that he spoke love to became crystallized and, and perfected while the water that he um, spoke hate and negativity to and um, not just even spoke, he would, he would like just send thoughts. Literally, he changed the molecular structure and other scientists tried this, this experiment too after he did it. You can look up his research, his book. He has an amazing book too. And um, people have even done the experiments with rice where they put rice in one jar and they speak love and healing to one and hate and negativity to one. Anyways, I'm just saying, I just wanted to um, bring that because I um, uh, mentioned that because water is very sacred and, and how we treat it is very important. And our ancestors knew that. and we're not treating things like our ancestors did anymore. And this is going to have a huge effect on us. We already know, we, we listen to what all of the other people before it said about what the military has done in other places. I have an activist friend in Hawaii um, and I wrote down what he said. Uh, he, he wrote a message for us from Guam. Um, not only did they, sorry, not only did the military break the Koloho, Kaholaole Aquifer, they're currently polluting the Oahu one with the Red Hill fuel tanks, and they're putting the one under Pohakulua. I'm so sorry if I'm not saying it's right, but they're putting that one at risk by using depleted uranium there. This is happening right now. The military is right now poisoning aquifers in Hawaii. In Japan, there, this is not something that was done a long time ago. They 
you know, they're still doing this all over and they know exactly what they're doing to our island. This is a war on our sacred water that we need to sustain ourselves. They're doing, I'm not even gonna hesitate in saying this, but I know that they're doing this on purpose because we can't be independent. We can't depend on ourselves without clean water. I have four children, so I will fight so hard to make sure that this resolution is passed, that I, will, I spread awareness every single day to people I know, because we need clean water. Um, I'm also part Palauan, and I take a lot of pride in the activists in Palau. Some of you might know Gabriela Nirmong. Gabriela Nirmong, uh, she is a peace and anti-nuclear activist from Palau. And um, during her activism, her and the 50 elder women that she brought to court, they were threatened. Her house was set on fire. Like th things got really bad there. And guess what? She still fought and she went to the United Nations and she was able to create the world's first nuclear free constitution banning the use, storage and disposal of nuclear weaponry in Palau. So I want all of us to gather the strength that we see from other people in our islands who have fought to protect the sacred, to protect our water, to protect our land. And I want us to continue doing that. And so I thank you so much, Senator, and everyone else that it continues uh, to do this. Um, I just want to end with a, a mantra, a Chamorro mantra that we use, uh, mantras for the Marianas. Right now we're only on Instagram. Um, we started like January 4, we, we do trash cleanups, we cringe over the water. Um, we're also all activists involved in Protella, Texas, and we love our island. We, we are not the people that, you know, leave trash around, we, we care. So many people have told us, oh, what about the trash that people dump. We don't, we don't do that. And we care about that too. We care about all kinds of contamination, all kinds of pollution. We want to hold our inner fresky and we teach our children to do that. So I'm just going to end with this um, tomorrow affirmation this mantra and it's for the water. And um, you know how I said Dr. Masarimoto proved that our intentions have a, a, an actual effect on water and the molecular structure. We will sometimes we'll, we'll gather, we'll hold water. This is actually water from the sink and 80% of that water comes from our aquifer that we want to protect. So I like to, you know, hold the water while I pray. And um, so anyways, I'm just going to say this chat. And you can, even if you can't do it with me, you can just set your intentions and just believe in affirm healing and protection over our water. Tahongina. Ile na lata ihanomta, humohomlu dan mapulaleni ihanomta, tahongina ile na lata ihanomta, humohomlu dan mapulaleni ihanomta, tahongina ile na lata ihanomta, humohomlu dan mapulaleni ihanomta. We are affirming that our water, we believe, is sacred. It's our life, and we're affirming that it's being healed and watched over. We're not asking for it. So that's what we do. Um, I just wanted to share that, and I wanted to inspire other people to do the same, to continue spreading awareness, um, support these senators, support this bill, um, and then keep fighting for what's right, and, all, and pray, pray for our water. Our children need clean water before our island. Tizu Osmasi. Dr. Luna, Tizu Osmasi, Katie. And I think it's so important that, you know, as indigenous peoples of this island, um, you know, we, we have to reconnect and we reaffirm our relationship to nature uh, that would restore the health of our community and restore the health of our environment. So I, I, I greatly appreciate um, your leadership and your courage to speak here today. Thank you. Um, so at this time, um, the next person uh, to testify is Nolan Flores. This is Masi, Senator Paris. Guahosi uh, Nolan Flores, Sizus Masi Puri Estina Oportunida. I provide this testimony in support of resolution number 55 36. This resolution recognizes the importance of the Northern Guam lands aquifer to the well being of our entire island environment and further acknowledges both the ongoing and impending effects.
that expanded military activity will have on this critical resource and the greater health of our island and our people. A 2019 report on the potential impacts of climate change on Guam's water resources conducted by the US Geological Survey finds that the NGLA, Guam's most important groundwater resource, will be greatly threatened by the effects of climate change. The report finds a, quote, projected 19% decrease in, in recharge and increased sea level on groundwater resources, end quote, which will ultimately, quote, decrease water availability from the NGLA, end quote. In recognizing and proactively addressing this projected decrease in water availability, Ilihes Latura just last year passed into law bill number 405-35, which established a task force to explore the creation of a groundwater conservation area on certain Gov Guam properties overlaying the NGLA. The Department of Defense's actions within the fence therefore run counter to these efforts and threaten our critical resources beyond the fence. The Department, itself, the, the Department of Defense itself recognizes the potential risks posed by the live fire training range complex stating in the 2015 SEIS that range operations, quote, have the potential to leach MCs, munitions constituents, to the water, end quote. Their solution for this, inspections, best management practices, and assessments every five years. Despite these so-called assurances, we need not look far to see examples of military negligence and instances of contamination of critical water resources. Perhaps the best, or should I say worst, instance is occurring in Okinawa, the site of Futenma Marine Base and Kadena Air Base, with PFAS, the toxic cancer-causing substance that is currently the center of a multi-state lawsuit and is known to have contaminated water supplies here in Guam and around military bases within the US and throughout the world. In Okinawa, according to an interview by The Intercept with John Mitchell, author of the book, Poisoning the Pacific, Okinawa's main water source, which serves 450,000 people, has been severely contaminated with PFAS, causing, quote, the highest level of PFAS ever recorded in a river in Japan, and extremely elevated blood levels of PFAS among residents of Okinawa. What caused this contamination? The article details several US military accidents at Kadena and Futenma, including a military barbecue, which inadvertently set off the firefighting system, a drunk Marine initiating the sprinkler system as an act of vandalism and a malfunctioning sprinkler system that discharged tens of thousands of liters of PFAS foam. The military's negligence is best summed up by this excerpt from the article. Quote, in April, when a bunch of Marines were in quarantine because of the coronavirus in a hangar on Futenma Marine Base in Okinawa, they decided to have a barbecue. The heat from the barbecue triggered the AFF system and then the Marines kind of panicked. The doors of the hangar had not been shut for 10 years and they were impossible to close. So most of the foam escaped into the local community. When the fire team finally arrived, they didn't have a key to the room to turn off the fire system. And so the sprinklers were firing for 25 minutes nonstop and there was so much foam, it went into the playground in the nearby river." End quote. Okinawa has since been forced to filter its drinking water to reduce the high levels of PFAS. And perhaps unsurprisingly, the US is not paying for the filtration and it is instead being footed by Japan. We cannot allow for our island's primary source of drinking water to meet the same fate. Madam Chair, the military's pollutive past and culture of contamination are reason enough for our island to oppose the construction of the LFTRC and oppose any expansion to military activity within our lands and waters. At risk is the very water that we drink, shower and brush our teeth with. At risk is the very health, safety, and well being of our people, not just our children, but us here today. This buildup, the increase in military activity, and the threat of contamination that come with them are not occurring soon or in several years. They are occurring now. The threat to our water already exists. We must act now. I thank you, and I thank your fellow co sponsors, and I thank the entire body for furthering the protection of our vital resources. And I, of course, urge all of our leaders and our entire community to unite around, unite around our water and take real steps toward change. This fight to protect our water, the most essential thing to human life, is a fight for our lives. Pragradesi Tempun Masi, Madam Chair. Masi Nolan. Yes, we must take heed of other communities that have suffered the fate of contamination. And we're here today, today to prevent that from happening. So we're just here to protect our future and our life.
to do its master. Um, at this time, I'd like to uh, recognize Eric Pastor from the uh, director of Hustle for Humanity Guam. Off day, good afternoon. Uh, thank you for letting us speak today. Uh, my name is Eric Pastor with Hustle for Humanity. Basically, we started Hustle for Humanity Guam here just this last month, first of April. Uh, the reason why I started it is my kids were born and raised here. They're Filipino American. We lived here over two decades. So we've seen um, a lot of things change throughout that time with the human rights violations of not just indigenous rights, but also with uh, different sectors throughout our island home. We wanted to make a change and be the first human rights group that support and advocate for the rights of uh, everybody who calls our island home and for um, everybody who, whether they're permanently living here or temporarily living here, we wanted to make a difference. Um, my main focus is uh, human rights education. Um, we protect, promote all the rights and we have a lot of advocates for the water, for contamination, environmental, um, different sectors. The thing I'd like to focus on today is the United Nations. I know it's hard to, with the issues that we had throughout the past and with uh, um, Julian, great uh, attorney for representing our rights and making some progress with the UNPO um, to get into the United Nations and have them come out with that report that they did recently. Uh, the Guam Legislature Re Resolution 5536, I fully support because it's human rights to safe drinking water, which is one of the five fundamental human rights aside from food, shelter, uh, health care. Um, with water, it is a fundamental human right, so without question, we have to support it. Its basis is um, built upon the referencing UN Resolution a uh RES 64-292, I think it is. And that's for a safe and clean drinking water and sanitation. Uh, based on it, that human rights are essential to full enjoyment of life and all other human rights. This year's theme being uh, valuing the water for um, Earth Water World Day. Uh, that theme I wanna build upon. There's a resolution that the UN has um, adopted on October 9th, 2020. So it's less than six months old. This uh, UN resolution, I encourage um, all of us to look at a little bit deeper. It's A-HRC-RES-45-8. Uh, um, 45 slash eight is the Human Rights Council resolution that was adopted by the UN. Um, with it being adopted by the Human Rights Council, it uh, is promotion and protection of all human rights, civil, political, economic, uh, social, cultural rights, including the right to development. This human rights is uh, to safe drinking and sanitation, the exact same heading, the exact same subject that um, Resolution 64292, uh, the United Nations Resolution, is built upon. This resolution that came out October 9th, 2020, 45-8, it recalls all resolutions of the General Assembly on human rights to safe drinking water and sanitation. In particular, it, it uh, is based off resolution 64-292, the what our Guam legislature resolution 5536 is based on. So this new resolution reference recalls the 64-292 and the main uh, basis of it is recalling the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development Goals, which Hustle for Humanity has a partnership with the UN to achieve the 2030 uh, Sustainable Development Goals. There's 17 SDGs, Sustainable Development Goals. Um, number six on the SDG chart is water. And um, I know uh, we had the thing going on at UOG for last week. Um, this resolution 458 focuses on number six, the 2030 agenda for stable development and other related goals, including incorporating important uh, targets related to human rights for safe drinking water. 
This resolution focuses on COVID-19 in particular with uh, safe and effective drinking water adequate supply in regards to um, outbreaks regarding COVID-19. So the three fourths of this resolution is primarily focused on COVID-19 and sustainable development goals. The section seven of this resolution calls upon states to implement the uh, sustainable development goals to combat COVID-19 and number six of the SDGs, uh, the water. It requests the secretary general and the UN high commissioner themselves for human rights to provide special uh, uh, rapporteurs with all resources necessary for effective fulfillment of this mandate. Um, so in section seven of uh, this resolution 45-8, um, it states, I, and I quote, we request the secretary general and the UN high commissioner for human rights to provide special rapporteurs with all resources necessary for effective fulfillment of this mandate. That includes dispatching them to areas throughout the world that need this issue addressed. And it's adopted without a vote. The very last page on the bottom, uh, page six, the last page on the bottom of this, it was adopted without a vote. So I don't, I, from what I had inquired, the message I got back from the UN, being that the United States wasn't, uh, there was issues of Trump going out of the UN and uh, um, on a 2018 resolution that was for safe, effective drinking water, um, US wasn't one of the states that had voted or was absent or abstained from the voting process because they weren't included with that issue. But this resolution was adopted without any vote um, and it's COVID-19 specific with SDG, uh, the 2030 Sustainable Development Goals specific agenda with um, the Secretary General and the High Commissioner being um, overseeing that this mandate is fulfilled. So I just wanted to present that uh, insight to see if that may help in a different perspective. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Eric, for that testimony. Um, and uh, yeah, we will definitely uh, follow up with that. And I believe um, Attorney Julian Ugin, you know, he's he's proceeded with it. Um, uh, he was successful in getting recognition um, with the high commissioners and the rapporteurs. So um, we, we look forward to the progress of that, uh, with the response by the, the U.S. government regarding that letter. Uh, so at this time, I want to recognize Julian Jansen from Bureau of Statistics and Plans. Uh, he oversees the federal consistency. Uh, so thank you, Julian, for, uh, for your presence here today and um, uh, hoping that you can shed some light on the regulatory process in regards to uh, federal projects. So you're, you're recognized at this time for your testimony. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Um, I'm Julian Jansen. I'm the federal Activities Planner of the Guam Coastal Management Program, also known as GCMP at the Bureau of Stat uh, Statistics and Plans. Uh, Hafeday Senators of the 36th Guam Legislature and members of the general public. Um, I'm testifying to provide background information with re respect to the Guam Coastal Management Program and federal consistency for federal activities and federal development projects. Uh, GCMP is the Coastal Zone Management Program for Guam our operations are governed by the Coastal Zone Management Act, federal regulations, and the Guam Coastal Management Program, and final environmental impact statement, and subsequent program changes. Federal consistency is a process where federal actions, such as those described in the resolution, are reviewed uh, to make sure that they are conducted consistently with duly adopted enforceable policies on Guam. These include locally adopted laws, executive orders, and regulations, which have been adopted through the initial program document or in subsequent program changes. Local laws, executive orders, and regulations, which are applied for federal consistent, consistency, generally pertain to land use regulations, such as appropriate siting for facilities for use, safety, efficiency, and prevention of erosion, um, protection of air and water quality, protection of fragile ecosystems and cultural heritage, uh, protecting endangered and threatened species, enhancing visual quality, 
encouraging development of recreation areas, preserving public access to beaches, recreational areas, and public lands, and maintaining agricultural lands for agricultural use. Um, GCMP is a networked agency which works with a number of local agencies to provide its responses to federal consistency cases, namely the Department of Agriculture, Department of Public Works, the Department of Parks and Recreation, the Department of Land Management, the Guam Economic, oh, sorry, Guam Environmental Protection Agency, and the Guam Waterworks Authority. Uh, the professionals of these agencies provide invaluable specialized knowledge and experience uh, to the federal consistency process so that GCMP can have a strong factual and legal basis for its positions and any conditions contained in responses to federal agencies' consistency determinations. Um, for your information, I want to briefly describe the timelines involved in federal consistency for federal activities and federal development projects. Um, federal agencies with proposed uh, federal activities or federal development projects are required to submit their consistency determinations, phase determinations, or negative determinations at least 90 days before a final decision, decision is intended to be made. Uh, following the receipt of a determination, GCMP has 60 days to provide its response. Uh, GCMP provides an opportunity to the public and its network partners to provide comments which may be incorporated into its response. Any objection or required conditions incorporated in its response must be based upon GCMP's enforceable policies. Uh, if GCMP does not provide its response within the given time, its concurrence is presumed. Um, so that's, that's all I had to say. Thank you very much for the opportunity to provide information to members of the Guam legislature and the general public with regard to GCMP and federal consistency. Thank you very much. Thank you, Julian. If you can just stay for a couple of questions, I know you have a meeting. Um, uh, so just, um, so regards to your role, um, so a lot of the work that's done from my understanding that, um, you know, federal consistency work involves the um, review of applications and um, your determination whether the project is going to have an effect on uh, our coastal waters, um, coast, the coast being Guam, including the terrestrial part of, of the island. So in looking at the project, so I did um, thank you for providing the um, federal consistency response for the marine cantonment uh, base and um, I'm just concerned because it was a conditional concurrence, meaning that there were some conditions that had to be met um, with in regards to stormwater management. And so in this case, it states that stormwater is prohibited from being discharged into GWA's wastewater systems. The runoff and the washdown area must not enter the wastewater system. Uh, discharges of stormwater, um, or water used for washdowns into a sanitary sewer is prohibited. Um, so as part of, um, you know, over, overseeing this, this project, um, you know, what is your role upon, uh, uh, I guess th th there seems to be perhaps a gap here because the water that goes, that, that doesn't go into the sewer system can potentially be run off can run off into the environment. Um, you know, what are some of the protections in place? Um, are there protections in place to prevent uh, contaminants that can come from the stormwater discharge? Um, actually, yes. Um, the, the thing is that that is the requirement of the uh, Guam, uh, Guam Water Works Authority and um, Actually, they have their the um, the military has their own um, MS4 permit um, out of the uh, U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, which we also have um, review uh, those sort of things as well um, whenever they're issued. And there was one that uh, that was issued like last year. And so they, they have to meet the US EPA's requirements for stormwater management, but they, they handle their own stormwater management separate from the GWA system. 
So who's who's responsible for uh, monitoring the stormwater discharge and what is the frequency of that monitoring and what type of contaminants are actually tested? Um, that would be um, that would be under the US EPA because it's the MS4 permit. Okay. And so somebody from this the region nine would be the one to yes. monitor. So it's not our local Guam EPA, it's the California based. Um you know I I'm not that I'm not that clear on that on that issue. Um that, that hasn't really been a uh, federal consistency issue, but they're the they do, but they do the the stormwater is um, is under an MS4 permit, which they got from U.S. EPA. So mm -hmm. it sh it probably I I wouldn't I don't know all the details of that one, but it it should be. Um, it should be under the auspices of US EPA Region 9. Okay, yeah, thank you for your response. So in regards to uh, protecting the coastal areas, um, are there any uh, monitoring that happens after an application is approved um, by coastal zone management, Guam Coastal Zone Management? I'm sorry, I'm not exactly clear on your question. Uh, yeah, so my question is, is there any monitoring after an application has been passed or approved? Considering that coastal zone management is supposed to uh, regulate um, the effects, right? The, the job is to uh, determine what the effects are to coastal areas. Um, is there any monitoring that takes place after a project has is, is com been completed? I mean, um, the, the requirements that we have are under local laws and regulations and the enforcement of those um, are given to specific agencies. Um, you know, like there, are, for some, some things which were not on the base, there are like development requirements, but, some, but like generally speaking, um, the things that are on base are not subject to those. So like, DLM generally doesn't get involved on base, but like uh, Department of Agriculture for um, would get involved if there's issues with regard to endangered species. Um, but of course, there's and that's and that's in their purview. And then um, environmental issues, um, discharges or whatever, if if they're covered, um, then they'd be under like you. Uh, um, uh, Guam EPA. Okay. So at this time, there's no program to uh, monitor after a project has been um, under coastal zone management. There's no uh, protocol in place to monitor. Is that correct? Um, I, I don't think that that's um, an accurate um, understanding of the federal consistency process okay. um, so because because like I, like I'm saying um, the enforcement authority um, is is given to different agencies um, the Guam coastal management program uh, does not does not enforce enforce those you know but if we if we were made aware of um, you know of anything where the uh, federal agency is not uh, doing what is represented in our uh, consistency uh, deter or in their consistency determination or our response to it, um, then there, there could be an adjudication process because that would mean that effectively they're uh, treating it as an objection. Okay, so there's a possibility for reevaluation something is consistent is that correct i think potentially but it generally hasn't been uh an issue and and the enforcement is really on the 
specific agencies which are given authority over the enforceable policies which are covered under GCMP's program. Okay, so have you had any information about, let's say, um, a non-compliance or violation of, of certain environmental laws? Would that trigger anything with, um, you know, coastal zone management? Is there, so that's what I'm asking, I'm trying to get at. Is there a way to have that communication so that it can be reevaluated? Is there a process in place? Should these enforcement authorities find that there's non-compliance? Um, would that trigger anything uh, with coastal zone management to reevaluate consistency? Um, I mean, I, I haven't been made aware of any of any instance. Of course, if there was, then we would uh, take the issue up with the uh, um, NOAA o, um, OCM. Okay. Uh, thank you for that. Um, does Coastal Zone Management have a protocol to determine cumulative impacts? Um, I believe we are uh, developing that capability. Okay, um, so, so that's that's one of our, um, I think that's one of our uh, improvement areas under section 309, but I can't really speak to that. Okay, all right. I think that's um, all my questions for now, but I do appreciate uh, your time. I just wanna allow my colleagues to ask any questions. Um, so we have uh, speaker Terlahi, I believe she was on. I'm not sure if she's still here. Uh, Speaker Chilahi, uh, you're you're welcome to um, for any questions at this time. Okay, maybe we'll get back to her. Uh, Senator Tello Taitipui, do you have any questions for uh, Mr. Jansen? Uh, not for Mr. Jansen uh, at all. VSP, you know, um, I I think they're. Uh, the monitoring uh, scenarios that they're doing right now, um, I think it could actually, you know, go go a little bit further. Even though certain things that on a regulatory basis that you do cover should cover a, a much wider range of, of overseeing certain, um, you know, projects, especially with what's happening um, through the coastal side and the land, but. Uh, um, I was hoping that the director of VSP would be on uh, today so we can ask some questions that uh, Mr. Jansen wasn't able to uh, answer. But um, I, nonetheless, I, I appreciate his opportunity to be here. Um, EPA um, sent, uh, speak, oh, he's calling you speaker, <laughs> chairman, uh, chairwoman uh, was not here. I noticed as well. Uh, they weren't on, but uh, I greatly, greatly appreciate everybody who is here to testify today and the importance of uh, recognizing this resolution. Um, I saw former Senator Hope Cristobal and listened to her and, and what she's had to say, so I greatly appreciate it. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, and thank you for allowing me to be a co-sponsor on this uh, important resolution. Thank you, Masti, Senator Tidegui, and for your support. Um, so I uh, would like to offer the floor to Speaker Chilai if she has any questions for uh, Mr. Jansen from Coastal Zone Management. Oh, no, no questions for Mr. Jansen. Thank you, Mr. Jansen, for your testimony and for the work at Coastal Zone Management, which um, I'm greatly appreciative of because it's one of the agencies that is actually very um, active in responding to all the requests for comments or, or input from um, from us in the legislature for the, especially on the military projects, when, because um, we're just not always able to get all the information that we would like. So I just appreciate your work in that regard. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. Um, so yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Jansen, for your presence and participation today. And uh, I do look forward to working closely with you in regards to developing uh, some of these ways we can continually strengthen the monitoring even after applications have been reviewed. So let's do us Masi. Okay, so um, at this time, I would like to recognize the next speaker uh, to provide testimony. 
um, uh, Arthur Polino from Yoji uh, Social Work Student Association. Um, you have the floor, Arthur. Thank you, Madam Senator. Buenas and half a day to the honorable senators before us today and to everyone else. My name is Arthur William Polino, and I am testifying on behalf of the Social Work Student Alliance in support of resolution number 55 36 relative to reaffirming our human right to safe drinking and clean water in observance of World Water Day 2021 and recognizing the importance of protecting our Northern Guam lands aquifer and precious water resource in ensuring the health of our people. So it is of great importance to protect our island's most valuable and treasured resource, which is water. For the past 3000 years, our Chamaru ancestors have cultivated our island and its agriculture by creating a unique oceanic civilization that kept our water sacred and those living species within our water safe. Up until today, our water is still and will always be an invaluable gift that is bestowed not just onto us, but also for the future generations to come. What makes Guahan unique is that our source of drinking comes from our very old Northern Guam land aquifer, also known as the NGLA. This source of water not only nourishes the plants on Guahan, but it is what keeps our people alive today, allowing our Chamorro culture to continue to flourish. Damaging our aquifer through military action or any action in general will not only limit our source of drinking, but if left unchecked, we will make our island uninhabitable. Un uninhabitable. As Tao Tao Tanu, we cannot let this happen. We cannot and we must not take our water for granted. Our NGLA provides our island with 80% of its drinking water. The UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples asserts that we have the right to conserve and protect our environment and its resources. It sets forth that the, that the government shall take effective measures to ensure that no storage or disposal of hazardous materials shall take place on indigenous lands without the people's free, prior, and informed consent. The EPA also states that any contamination of groundwater will not only result in poor drinking water quality, but any attempt at a cleanup can cost thousands or even millions of dollars. This is even assuming that a cleanup is even possible. With all of this being said, as an island community, we have to remind ourselves that water is not just an element, but it is what makes up our humanity and our Chamorro civilization. It is what keeps us grounded in our cultural practices and it is what sustains our connection to our ancestors. Lastly, this precious resource of ours is what continues to keep us rooted and strengthened on our island of Guahan. The Social Work Student Alliance urges all members of this esteemed body, Ili Helefaturan Guahan, to support resolution 55-36 and preserve our most vital resource and precious water and to protect what is sacred for the generations to come. Odankolo na Sizus Maasi for listening to our testimony and Madam, Sen Madam Senator Sabina Flores Perez, thank you so much for allowing us to come in today to present our concerns to you. Thank you. Sizus Maasi, Arthur, and I just like to recognize the presence of uh, uh, your other colleagues, um, Alia Alvarez, Corinth Uggen, and I believe Samantha Samora from the Social Work the Student Alliance. And thank you for your assistance in actually helping draft the, the resolution. So thank you very much. Um, so at this time, I'd like to recognize uh, Ms. Kelly Masagua here. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm on. Sorry. Oh. Okay, so we do have Kelly. Okay. Uh, Kelly, uh, you're recognized and thank you for being here. Hi. Um, 
Buenos and half a day. My name is Kelly Jean Mosca. I'm 16 and a junior attending George Washington High School. I'm representing the Inafamalic Youth Heritage Program. Tizuos Maasi, Zansaina Maasi, for the opportunity to speak here on behalf of the future generations. First off, I'd like to say thank you, all the senators who have signed on to this resolution for considering us Iman Hoban, the youth of our island. We are grateful for this resolution because it shows us that our leaders actually care for us. The decisions that are made today regarding the treatment and care of our land, our waters, and our air will have long lasting effects on the people who inherit the land, and that's us. Water is important to our lives. Water is the defining element that sets the earth apart from the other lands in our solar system and allows for all life forms to flourish and thrive. As oceanic peoples, water is an invaluable resource for us. Our entire ecosystems, the systems that sustain our lives, our food source, our source of inspiration, lies in, our, lies in the water. Our people need clean water to cook, to clean, and to nourish our bodies and plants and our animals. It is scientifically proven that the proposing fire range above the northern aquifer of our island will be a huge hazard for our people. I can barely imagine what thousands of bullets containing lead launched over the land and into the sea would cause. Lead poisoning is a serious health hazard and it is not something we can just brush off our backs. I am destined to live a life in sickness. Am I destined to live a life in sickness? What happens if our aquifers get contaminated? What do they want? Why do they want this specific land? This is where our ancestors cultivated and lived. It is sacred to the culture, to the culture and the people of Guam. The real question is what will be left for us youth from the defects of this firing range? And who will be held accountable for ensuring our health, ensuring our rights to clean water? Sometimes I think to myself and I wonder about my future. I worry whether or not I will get to live a long, healthy life. I worry that one day my children will never get to breathe the same air, walk through the same land, or understand their culture the way we were able to. To live a healthy lifestyle the way our Manunku did, living off the land. Sorry. Many times I wish we knew how to speak. I knew how to speak my language. This is already something that we have lost and we're trying to gain back. I don't want to ask the question, but what more can be taken from us? But I do wonder someday, will I not know how clean water tastes or will my skin burn? Or will my skin and insides burn from the contamination? Will I live long enough to see my grandchildren or will my body suffer from being poisoned by the fallout from the firing range? Sorry. I encourage you, our leaders, to help me find the answers to these questions, to draft and pass policies and regulations that ensure that I am still able to turn the land and embrace the culture that is in front of me. Do not let us, the children and the future generations be the victims of the decisions or actions that could have been prevented. Instead, let us live our lives with hope and security. Let us inherit a future of health and happiness. Let us live to drink and bathe in our clean waters. In closing, I would like to quote the Inifresi. Hua fresin maisezu, parabai pritehi, zanhudi fendi, i henengi, i kotura, i lenguahi, i airi, i hanam, zanitanu chamoru. I offer myself to protect and to defend the beliefs, the culture, 
the language, the air, the land, the land of tomorrow, which are our inherent God-given rights. We thank you for doing the same. Kelly. Um, yes, this is our ancestral land. We've been living here for over 3,000 years and we knew how to protect our environment. And you know, your, your testimony is a, a testament to how strong our culture is and the, the desire and the commitment to protect our homeland um, for our people and for future generations. So thank you for your courage and your testimony here today. Masi. At this time, I would like to recognize Joni Kerr um, to provide her testimony. Um, Senators of the 36th Guam Legislature, fellow residents of Guam, and those who are listening in the diaspora. Um, My name is Joni Kenga Kerr. I teach introductory marine biology and chemistry at Guam Community College. I'm also a faculty advisor of the GCC Eco Warriors. Uh, which is a student and community organization, we are dedicated to protecting the environment. Our motto is learn, lead, protect. And over the last nine years, we have led events such as cleanups, the March to Protect Mother Earth to raise awareness of global warming. And we've protested irresponsible development in both the private and military sectors, including the destruction of pristine limestone forests to build a live fire training range at Ritidian Palalu. On behalf of the Eco Warriors, I strongly support Resolution 55-36, which reaffirms the right of the people of Guam to clean, safe drinking water and the importance of protecting the Northern Guam Lens Aquifer that provides 80% of the water that we use. We are deeply concerned that the military's mission is being implemented at the expense of our natural resources and our current and future generations. The military has an abysmal record with respect to protecting the environment wherever it has installed bases and firing ranges throughout the world. And, and um, Rick Perez and um, Senator former, Hope, former Senator Hope Cristobal talked about this. Um, these, there are numerous research studies, white papers that document heavy metal contamination in both the US and foreign countries such as Okinawa and Germany. Indeed, some of these areas have been shut down because they were deemed too toxic for soldiers to train. In Puerto Rico, Hawaii, Alaska, and Guam, the people most affected by military toxic waste are indigenous minority groups who lack adequate political representation and or their colonial status relegates them to positions that lack effective influence in such matters. Presently, there remain at Anderson Air Force Base Superfund sites that have not been cleaned up. Indeed, nothing can ever be done to resolve one problem that, result, that involves groundwater contaminated by the solvent trichloroethylene or TCE. And that is due to what has been termed a technical impracticability. TCE is a powerful degreaser. It's to use to clean machinery and aircraft. And any attempt to remove this TCE would cause salt water to intrude, intrude into the freshwater lens. So, um, and this is because TCE is denser than water and it has moved below the freshwater lens and it sits above the salt water layer uh, um, in the aquifer. So what passes for a remedy, a remedy um, a deemed a remedy by the military amounts to monitoring the site and not allowing pumping of any groundwater. Indeed, the contamination is permanent. A major concern that I've raised in the past is the amount of heavy metals, particularly lead, 
that is released when firearms are discharged. The millions of bullets that will be fired will release lead dust into the air, soil, and other surfaces. I've attached a 2017 reference entitled Lead Exposure at Firing Ranges, and it's a review. Uh, it's from the journal Environmental Health. The article speaks to blood, blood lead levels, or BLLs, found in individuals who work at or frequent firing ranges. But it also describes how lead dust can be transported on an individual's clothing to their home and family members, how it can be carried in the air, contaminate the soil and groundwater, of course, as well as make its way into the wildlife and biota. The adverse health effects due to exposure to and ingestion of lead have been well documented. Should this firing range be allowed to be built, our people, our children, our ecosystem will bear the major consequences. So some might argue that the military might have learned its lesson from the many toxic and unusable land, surface and groundwater and seawater that it has left in its wake, that they will abide by the Clean Water Act, the Endangered Species Act and section 106 of the National Historic Preservation Act. But we've all seen the caveat, the words that often accompany military actions. And these words are in the interest The words are in the interest of national security. All too often, all too often these words they are used as an excuse that pass for validation. In closing, the GCC Eco Warriors commend the sponsoring senators for introducing this comprehensive resolution to protect our water now and for future generations. Sinema Asi. Tony, thank you for your testimony. Um, I think we all share the concern uh, that our, our community faces. Thank you so much for being your, for your brave braveness. So um, at this time, I would like to recognize uh, Chelsea Duenas from Allied Marianas, the Social Progress Podcast. Hafide, um, I was wondering if you meant Vanessa Duenas or Chelsea Cruz. Dispensa Zu Hongan, yeah, I'm um, Chelsea Cruz, and my email was from the Social Progress Podcast. I don't know if that's who you're calling on. Okay, I think we have a, yeah, I think, uh, yeah, Chelsea, uh, we can recognize your recommends. Um, thank you, Senator. And thank you everybody that has spoke so far before me. I embrace and I uplift everybody's courage and I appreciate everybody um, for being here today. If I can, Senator, I would welcome the room to do some breathing as we continue on. This is a lot of, um, it's a lot of hard things to say and I really encourage all of us for being here today. Um, so I like to say half a day. Today, I encourage myself to speak my tomorrow truth. So I will leave all the facts and the science to the rest of the room. I also use myself as a public example to our people to say, we don't need to know it all and we don't need to be perfect, but we do need to show up. I reach you from Komaye land, home to the human speaking people of Hoken stock, known today as San Diego, California and give gratitude to Zoom, a tool my grandparents and Nana Itata did not have in their time to use as a communication tool to speak on the importance of our water. I even choke when I say to speak on the importance of our water. 
I show my representation as a descendant and an ancestor to the elders and the youth of Guahan to affirm my support for the resolution number 55-36, Protehe Latektan, Save Retidian, and all the prayers, efforts, and organizers, both home base on Guahan, Zani Tomorrow Diaspora, United States. I am grateful for the opportunity to openly share and would like to be vulnerable enough to say that in early childhood, I was too busy playing with the nannies to listen to why my grandparents were meeting with others every week with their signs on the road, waving at people's attention, showing up and listening to a man that spoke about Guam's main water source being under attack since the 1900s, a man that people went against. I remember my grandparents always showing up and listening to this man. Even when he left Guam for Hawaii, my grandmother prayed for him, what seemed like was all day. As an adolescent, I was angry at the world because of life experience and I ignored why my grandparents kept giving all their money to leaders on Guam every two to four years. I ignored each time I saw my grandparents get let down or abandoned by the same people they gave their money, energy and support to. Promises left unkept. At 18, I left Guahan for the United States. Land of opportunity is what was told to me and so it is. But I mean, what is opportunity? At 30, I see. Throughout my youth and young adulthood, I was angry. I grieved, ignoring my grandparents' work. Today, I am not outraged. I am not saddened by the fact that I need to put black words on a white paper to express the importance of our water for our children. Because let's clear the smoke. It is for our children. Words like saddened or outrage would be a lack of expression to how I feel. I can say that I am filled with light and see the realities of the acts our peoples face today, because this is an act, a conscious act of violence against our people, lands, and waters. I am here to say I am no longer angry and I forgive the leadership you provided my grandparents. <laughs> On their behalf and as they request, I ask you to show their children and grandchildren today. I am present and I am listening for my grandparents and the children after me. The coronavirus global pandemic has shined mass light to the very dark and ignored cracks that all the children fought through in this world today. It has shown us the spirit of youth drug abuse on Guahan, the realities of our people's pains through the rise of sexual assault and abuse being done to our children and elders by our people. And now the water, a natural resource that man has no business tampering with, a natural resources that man does not want to go against. Our daily actions today have influence on the fourth generation. Our daily actions today have influence on the four generations after us and so on. Guam's histories have shown us this as we face the results of our past and today. I close this message with a softness. I call out to our leaders and people of Guahan. Yes, leaders and people, because it's not just one, but all of us that need to show up. I am affirming your hard work and I uplift you. Your job is not easy, but this is yours to do. So I come to gift you with indigenous science, love, compassion, kindness, understanding, and some other values, and as I encourage you to stand with Guam and the Marianas in solidarity to protect our natural resources, along with passing resolution number 55-36, not just for an awareness day, but for the people and earth herself. It is one thing to say these words, but another to act on it. Let my message today be an act of encouragement and beacon of light and support. Although Guam has faced many hardships, we are in a unique position as an island far away from the lands to learn from the many mistakes that they make daily. I am in full support of resolution number 55-36 since stand with Pertahela Texan, Save Retidian, the senators, I am greatly appreciated for you guys even having the thought to bring this opportunity to the people and allowing us to speak openly and honestly today. I uplift the people and the youth and I encourage us to pass this resolution because accountability for our actions will be served. And I ask the room if this is okay, Senator, if people can put in the chat who they think our who they think will inherit the accountability of our actions.
today. If that's okay, I ask right. you guys, I welcome you guys to put it in the chat. And I would also ask if I can close with a mantra by the mantras of Marianas. Um, I am in support of the mantras of Marianas here in the diaspora as I encourage awareness and accountability out here in the United States to focus the groundwork that everybody does on Guam today. I will translate in tomorrow and in English. It is titled Tina Zutzut, and I'm still learning tomorrow, so forgive me in advance. Parigat Litsan, Parigat Lagu, Parigat Katsan, Parigat Hadza, Asaina, who are again how, when you see to do Pagu Naisigonu, Asaina, who are again how, when you see to do Pagu Naisigonu. This is a prayer um, with intentions, and it read in English towards the left for the west, towards the ocean for the north, towards the right for the east, towards the land for the south. Ancestors, I'm calling on you. I need your guidance now. Ancestors, I'm calling on you. I need your guidance now. And again, I would just like to say, Sidus Masi, thank you very much for allowing us to be here and available, um, uh, not only with the people, but with all the organizers and all our um, senators and everybody on Guahan. I share this prayer as a message to the youth that the things we face today are something that the human body is not capable of accomplishing. As we've seen throughout generations, I wanna encourage you all that we are a spirit of love and light and I wanna seek you um, to pray and, uh, and I uplift you for showing up being a young person um, in a room that um, to be able to share your concerns and, and the, the, the very, um, uh, crucial matters that we face today. Sidus Masi. Thank you, Luna Sidus Masi, Chelsea, for your inspiration and uh, your uplifting words and your leadership. So you may be young, but I think you're you're very um, wise in your age. So Sidus Masi. Um, so at this time, uh, I would like to recognize uh, Erica Pangolinen from the Soil and Water Conservation District uh, to provide testimony. Erica. Buenos and half a day, Senator Sabina Perez and members of the committee. My name is Erica Pangolinen and I am the district manager representing on behalf of the Southern Guam Soil and Water Conservation District. The Southern District fully supports Resolution 55-36 as presented and echoes the same sentiments provided by our Northern District counterpart. Although the districts are divided by boundary, we are always together in our mission to promote the conservation and protection of Guam's precious resources. As I'm looking to you, Senator Perez, I can't help but think back to all of the educators symposiums that you've helped facilitate uh, with the districts and in that capacity, hundreds of Guam's teachers were trained on soil and water conservation and, um, and so that they can pass the knowledge to our children in the classroom about the importance and the issues that faces our natural resources. Fast forward today, you are serving in a much uh, bigger capacity as Senator taking conservation to a needed level and pushing the rights and needs uh, of our people in terms of our environment and our ecosystem. And although there's so much work to be done, we look forward to the great work ahead. And with that, the Guam SWCDs will continue to do our part and work with our partners and private landowners to protect and conserve our soil and water resources. So in closing, and Dunkaluna Sizu Ma'asi to all the senators for this much needed resolution. And thank you to our leaders and supporting organizations for stepping up and for all the courage you do to seek uh, what is, to do what is right. And I'm just so moved by all the powerful testimonies that were provided here. Biba World Water Day and Tzidus Maasi again. Biba Tzidus Maasi, Erica, and uh, for your commitment and uh, you're being here today to provide testimony and support for such an important measure. 
And you're right, it's, it's more than just uh, celebrating, uh, affirming our right to human, our human right to, to safe drinking water, but um, it's a commitment that we, we hold dearly to do as Masi. Um, so uh, at this time, uh, I'd like to recognize uh, Vanessa Duenas. Um, Buenas and half a day. I am currently zooming from the ancestral lands of the Nishinan, Maidu, and Miwok here in the Sacramento region of California. My name is Vanessa Duenas. I am the co-founder and chair of the nonprofit organization Allied Marianas. I am also a community organizer for the newly formed Masakata Collective, a grassroots organization created in response to concerned Famalao and Chamorro and non-binary people in the Chamorro diaspora. I am also writing on behalf of Chamorro scholar, activist, community organizer, Professora Antoinette Sharferos McDaniel, who is the founder of Chamorro Pathways in Higher Education and the director and board member of the Chamorro Association of the Midwest. I am writing to express my full and informed support of resolution number 55-36 in solidarity with the nonprofit organization Protehi Latexin Save Retidian that reaffirms access to safe and clean drinking water is a fundamental human right and recognizes the importance of protection of Guam's sole source aquifer, the Northern Lands Aquifer. As a Chamorro activist and scholar, it is alarming to see the over-militarization of our islands in the Marianas, and in this specific case, the clearing and desecration of ancient vill village sites and ancestral remains, the disregard for endangered species, and the constant neglect of the rights of the Chamorro people, in this case, the fundamental human right to safe and clean drinking water on the island of Guam. It is not a question of if the Northern Lands Aquifer, of which provides the residents with 80 to 90% of clean drinking water, will be contaminated, but when. I am concerned for the long-term effects that this inevitable contamination will have on the indigenous and local people living on Guam. I'm outraged that since the US gained these islands as spoils of war, the indigenous and local people of the Marianas have been in constant battle in defending their cultural and human rights. I am a deeply concerned indigenous Chamorro woman and American citizen when I submit this testimony that expresses my full and informed support of resolution number 55-36. I express full opposition to the continuation of building of the live fire, fire training complex and separate hand grenade range on the island of Guam. And overall the continued over-militarization, rape and desecration of our ancestral lands in the Marianas. Thank you so much, senators, for your time and for the opportunity to express my views. Thank you, Luna Zuzuzmasi, Vanessa, for your, for, for your presence and participation and providing uh, support, Zuzuzmasi. Um, at this time, I would like to recognize um, Clarissa Torres uh, for her testimony. Um, I'm here today to remind each one of us other residents of Guam and especially the rest of the government entity that we are all connected to the elements and the earth. When we we're created by God, we were made up from the dirt, the earth, which is connected to our digestive system, which converts food into energy or chi. The breath of, of God, the wind, the air, is connected to our respiratory system as well as each animal that breathes life. Our fire, which is connected to our cardiovascular system, our metabolism, and our passion is what stirs us to be here today to protect our land, our air, our ocean, and our fire. The water is 70% of our body. It is connected to our immune system, especially our kidneys, which flushes out the toxins from our bodies. And it is also connected to our emotions, our intuition. So let it be remembered that we were placed here on this earth to be 
protectors of God's great creation. It is our, it is our duty as stated from God above and in our inner fessy to take care of our environment, to protect it and to respect it because it is something gifted from God. It is our duty as the generation here to protect it and take care of it for the generations ahead, for our children and the children that they will have. So I ask each one of us and most especially those who are still deciding on this, on this resolution to please take this into consideration and remember the interfrasi that we all stand by to protect and defend our air, our earth, our water, and our fire. Thank you. This is Masi Clarissa. Thank you for that prayer and uh, um, the intent and your testimony. Uh, at this time, I'd like to recognize um, Bobby Beneventi for her testimony. Is um, is Bobby Beneventi? Is she present? Okay, so um, not getting a response. Maybe we'll come back to Bobby later. Um, so I was asked to uh, maybe I'll just go on to Lillian. Is Lillian um, she uh, here to prevent, present testimony? I'm sorry. Um, I believe. Okay, I'd just like to recognize, um, let's go back to Bobby. I think you're on mute. I don't know if you were trying to provide testimony. Oh, okay, good. Okay, we'll, we'll give Bobby some time. Uh, we'll move on to uh, Lillian. Lillian, if you would like to provide testimony, you're recognized. And if you can turn on your video. So I'm not getting response with Lillian. Uh, maybe we'll come back. So uh, Deline Camacho. Is Deline Camacho here? You would like to testify. Uh, you have the floor. Okay, I'm not getting response from Deline. Uh, we can always come back. Uh, Gina Marie, uh, you are on the list for to testify. Um, you're recognized. Gina Marie. Hello. I was um, just observing, but I will say that I am in support of uh, this resolution. I am. Um, Zooming in from uh, the traditional Diné and Hopi and Tewa lands in Flagstaff, Arizona, and um, uh, my own Chamorro DNA uh, connects me to Wahan, and uh, I am very uh, moved by everybody's um, uh, testimony this evening, and I am very um, encouraged to hear people that are um, working so hard to um, protect the personhood of this aquifer and of this beautiful space and the, the water that is sacred. And um, I just wanna say thank you to everyone for uh, doing this work. And um, 
I want to voice my support for continuing the protection of it. And that is all. I am complete. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Gina Marie, for um, for staying up so late. I know it's uh, probably past midnight over there, but thank you for for uh, participating and uh, for your testimony. Um, it's greatly appreciated. Okay, so the next um, one we have on the list is, um, so I believe Eva was here earlier. And then also Jesse Chargaloff signed up earlier and then Checha. So is there anybody else that's present that would like to testify? And if we can go back to Bobby and Aventi. Oh, hi, uh, Senator. Hi, good evening. Hi, good evening. Um, oh, great. I can I, see uh, you great. I can... Hi. I, I, I sign up to provide testimony, but I guess you called me. I was observing. Um, I don't have a written um, testimony, but I am in support of this resolution. I'm just feeling a, a lot of emotion right now. And one of the things that's foremost in my mind is this whole effort worldwide and in the United States and here on Guam to vaccinate at least half, half of our uh, community, half of our island's residents to ensure greater safety for ourselves and for our families. And yet we have to justify our rights to clean drinking water, our rights to protect our uh, resources here on this island, our right to protect our land. And it just seems so frustrating and odd that the most obvious, the most obvious human need is under threat, continues to be under threat by powerful militarized organizations that are made up of human beings. These systems that say they work hard to protect us, our future, uh, protect us from attacks from other countries that threaten us. And yet, right under our feet, right in our presence with what the military, the US military is doing, continues to do for years and years and years, is something that we're still trying to convince our community and our leaders and the president of the United States and the heads of the military that this is just not good. It's not good for us now. It's not good for our newborn babies. It's not good for the future of our children and our grandchildren's children. Um, I support this. I, I don't know what else we can say as indigenous people of this island. You know, I'm angry. I have members of my family that are serving in the military and those are choices that they make. But I'm sure as soldiers of the different branches of the US military, it wasn't something they choose to do. They're not choosing to poison our waters. They're not choosing to destroy the land and destroy the, the ancient burial sites of our ancestors. They're not choosing that. They're choosing this idea of protecting and fighting fighting for the U.S., Guam being part of the U.S., we're fighting to keep safe. But we're not safe. The U.S. is not keeping us safe on this island. And I ask every single person who serves in, this, in the military to think about what it might be like should they choose to live on Guam and raise their children and grandchildren and great grandchildren, what would it be like for them to, to know 
that their actions right now as part of the U.S. military is threatening our, our lives, our health, our future, the life of this land. My husband is a fisherman, and every time I speak in a public hearing, I mention him because he's an awesome provider and has always been a farmer, a fisherman, um, who provides not just for our immediate family, but shares his catch of fish and octopus and lobsters and crabs. He shares that with neighbors and extended family members. And more and more over the last 42 years, the resources are dwindling. Access to these fishing grounds are limited. The waters are contaminated. Lands are destroyed. I mean, I, I guess it's good that I don't have a written testimony because it will probably restrict me from just speaking from my heart, but I speak from my heart right now. I support this resolution. I thank you and, and other senators for putting this forth. I believe with all my heart it will pass. Um, and it's just the beginning. It's just the beginning. It's just one step of a comprehensive act that we as a whole community must push forward with so much aggression, with no, with no apologies for what we must do right now to protect our people in all ways. Anyway, um, I had my second Moderna shot today. So um, I do that because part of me believes that it is my duty to do what we're called upon for herd immunity. Um, it's not just about this pandemic, man. It's about everything around the environment that also needs to be protected, that we must all step up. Every single one of us, every single soldier that, that lives on this island, that may choose to make Guam their home, everyone who has settled on this island, who has chosen to raise families on this island, we have an obligation. We have an obligation to step up and say no more. Enough has been enough like a hundred years ago or at least 60 years ago or 70 years ago, but um, things have to change. We can't, we can't find ourselves two years from now, four years from now, proposing legislation, resolutions to protect our, our land, to protect our culture, to not disrespect our, our, the sites where our ancestors are buried. So I, I, um, I thank you. I pray to the Lord that things will change quickly so that we are all truly kept safe and that we live in a land of peace and not continuing to prepare for this war, whatever war, maybe, you know, uh, threats from other countries. I pray that we realize that we are under threat right now by the country that's supposed, supposed to be protecting us. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. This is Masi Bobby. Uh, Bobby. Words and uh, commitments. And um, yes, we're st um, I'm very honored to be a part of this community. Uh, and I stand in solidarity with, with you all. And thank you for being brave and um, you know speaking truth. Um, and it's really just about the love of our island, right? We're trying to protect our future, our island. And... Um, it's, you know, it's for all, protecting it for all. 
So uh, I was asked to also write, uh, sorry, read aloud uh, testimony provided by uh, Clarissa White. Um, okay, so it says, Hafadei Todos Hamsu. As a teacher, activist, and el elected delegate to the California Democratic Party, I have witnessed avoidable tragedies that have occurred because people have been more taken with power and the appearance of control than with justice and human dignity. This is why I take a stand against continued military overreach in the Marianas. As someone who explains difficult concepts to children, I've thought of how to explain the continued degrading and harmful effects of exploitation of the Mariana Islands and waters by the Department of Defense. Please consider that intention should never outweigh the actual and probable sustained impact of future tainted water sources and continued desecration of ancestral artifacts and preservation of our culture. In this metaphor, I'd, I'd use to explain colonization of the Marianas to children. I want us to think simply. Let's pretend the US military is a childhood friend who saved another friend from a scary unsafe situation. Let's say the US savior friend then decided to take the child who had experienced traumas um, house for an indefinite amount of time and control the latter child's future use of space and resources, feeling fully entitled. Is this fair? Is this equitable? What are the consequences of continued Department, Department of Defense projects that do not prioritize indigenous island, islanders' rights? With the US military saving many chamals from Japanese occupation when my nana was a child, many fall susceptible to believing that we must defer to military decisions, even if they negatively impact the health, safety, and cultural longevity of our peoples. I do not hold this mindset. I'm writing to express my full and informed support of resolution number 55-36 in solidarity with the nonprofit Britannia Latex and Save Britannia that reaffirms access to clean water as a human right and highlights the importance of protecting Guam's sole source aquifer, the Northern Lens Aquifer. As many community members, including my peer, Vanessa Duenas of Allied Marianas and Masakata Collective have stated, I'm a deeply concerned indigenous Chamal woman and American citizen when I submit this testimony that expresses my full and informed support of resolution 5536. I express full opposition to the continuation of the building of the live fire training complex and the separate hand grenade range on the island of Guam and, the, and overall the continued over militarization, rape and desecration of our ancestral islands in the Marianas. Please consider how and if our future grandchildren will be able to steward the lands and water safely. And if there will, there will be safe, clean water in the future, if this resolution should not pass. This is not a decision that should be taken lightly. It is past time we respect indigenous rights. It is past time we honor and preserve our land, waters, and culture. To do us Maasi, Claire White of the Teheran family. Um, I would like to open the floor to my colleagues for any comments or um, remarks. Uh, Speaker Chalahi. Afadeh, thank you, um, Madam Chair. It's very hard to follow all of that testimony. It, uh, but I want I want you all to know that uh, I think it's. Um, really important what you have done today by being here and speaking up. And I know that it's not easy and it's very emotional and to have to like go there again, you know, uh, in your spirit, uh, it's, it's very difficult sometimes. So um, I'm very grateful. And I want to, you know, when this resolution first came to me, I was thinking, World Water Day, uh, you know, just that topic alone, I was like, we all know water is important. It's, but then when I read the resolution, it's actually such an excellent resolution. I was very proud to be the first co-sponsor on it because this resolution goes, um, it, it, it gives us in a snapshot everything that we need to know 
to not just, you know, um, know what's going on, know what the rights are according to the United Nations, know what's going on on Guam, know the hard truth, the very, very, very hard truth about Guam and what has happened in the past, know what is happening now. And, um, and this resolution is really a call to action. And so I, I thank all of you who recognize that and who have called for accountability and action by all of us. And, and it really does take all of us. I'm convinced of that. Um, in everything that I've ever done, I have seen it over and over that by myself cannot accomplish what only all of us can accomplish and that it takes every person in every role to use that role that they are in right now to, to do this, to advocate, not just for clean water in general, but to be very specific and point out those things that people really don't want to believe. And I want to spare them from the truth as well, but but we can't right now because they need to hear the truth if we are going to compel them to action. And that's, you know, unfortunately, I wish I could spare all the youth this, but unfortunately, or fortunately, I think it's the youth that is going to help us to call to action everybody who needs to act. They, um, you know, people don't want to believe easily that contamination is present, first of all. They don't want to believe that contamination is conscious. It wasn't just an accident. They don't want to believe that contamination after, um, you know, all the cautions, all the warnings, after the past mistakes, that future contamination is, is still very possible and should be avoided at all costs. I really believe that. And I'm, I'm so glad to have all of you here today to help us to try to achieve that. To not be fooled, to not be complacent, to not be apathetic, but to be active um, and to be convinced that what we do may not benefit us directly, but it will benefit future generations. It will spare them, we hope, this feeling, this feeling where we have to cry during testimony because it is so compelling. It is so, it hurts, it's painful. It's painful to know that these things happen to our island that we love so much. It happens to our people who we love so much, our families, and uh, that, that we might be allowing this to happen to our children and our grandchildren and future generations who we haven't even met yet. How could we allow that? And so I just wanna thank all of you again from the bottom of my heart. It, it takes all of us and I am so very, very grateful when things get difficult to have people like you who are willing to to stand up, to let yourselves be heard, to do the hard work that it takes to do this type of thing, to testify, to stand up in front of everyone and, and show your commitment. And I'm very, very grateful. And thank you, Madam Chair, for your work on this resolution. It is, um, it is really a, a good um, snapshot of what we are facing here on Guam what we need to do and um, who we need to address to get that done. So Sizu Masi, Sizu Masi to everyone. Thank you so much, Speaker. Uh, it was well said and um, definitely appreciate your strong support and um, everybody's support for Sizu Masi. Uh, Senator Tello Taitugui, um, you recognize for me the next. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. And I, I don't want to keep anyone much longer. I mean, we've been here since three o'clock um, talking about this. And I, and I think it was that important that I um, maintain this uh, um, uh, being on this Zoom and hearing everybody who came to testify. Like the speaker said, it's very difficult, you know, sometimes for people to come forward 
and and I I think it was uh, one of the other speakers who spoke about having family members who were in the military, and uh, but what she said was so profound. You know, they're in the military, but they don't agree to poisoning any of the lands or the our water. I mean, they're not there for that, and it's so true. We have many. Uh, people in Guam who have family in the military. And and uh, I think she said it perfectly, how she said that. And I greatly appreciate her mentioning that. Uh, Joni, I really appreciate your testimony. Um, as always, you know, being up at the forefront when it comes to being an advocate out, out for protecting our island and our resources. And your very touching and warming uh, testimony. But to everybody that was here, I, I'll, I'll try and keep this very, very short. Donka Lucy just Masi, your voice is needed. It is definitely needed. If you're silent, they won't hear you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Senator Taibigui. And uh, thank you to all who have come here today um, to you know record our, you know, our basically it's you know, we, we give them no consent uh, to continue with um, continued the, the, uh, desecration of our lands and contamination of our waters. And uh, we definitely appreciate everybody's strength and courage. And I, you know, I really want to thank everybody that's come here today. Um, and we still are accepting testimonies. Um, and this becomes record. And this is so important because uh, in addition to it becoming record, we can also there's a, there's a means to address this. And, um, you know, by no, you know, we are still playing active roles um, despite all the challenges and because that's, that's what's necessary. So um, thank you so much for being here today. And uh, at this time, uh, the committee now adjourns. The time is 5.29 PM. Take care. Sijus Masi. Sijus Masi. Adios. <laughs>